Glory be to Allah, all praise to Allah, there is no God but Allah, Allah is great, all power and might belong to Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is uh, <clears throat> very much that we can learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his creation. And uh, if we know even some of the basic attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we can say very much about him. The ulama say that there is a wealth of knowledge in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you know, for example, someone to be an honest person and someone tells you that he told a lie or that he stole or so no you say he's not a, he's not a person who does something like this so you can judge about someone based on your knowledge of him the same thing with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you know his real attributes then you can say, no, Allah would not say uh, something like this. Allah will not abstain from saying something like this. I give you um, some examples from the Quran. Um, I think we gave this example before. That some people said, Allah never sent any message to anyone. The Quran said, وَمَا قَدَرُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّنْ شَيْءٍ They have no... <coughs> That's why they don't want me to talk for a long time. Right? <laughs> they, uh, the, the, the Quran said, وَمَا قَدَرُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They have not given Allah his due when they said that he never sent a message to everyone, anyone. This means that if you think about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you can come to the conclusion that he must send messages to human beings, even before you are told about this. Another example, the Quran says, وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً When they commit an indecency, they say, قَالُوا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهَا آبَاءَنَا We found our fathers forefathers doing this. Wallahu amarana biha. And Allah ordered us to do this. The Quran replies, Qul inna Allah la ya'mur bil fahsha. Ataquluna ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. Tell them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not command people to commit indecencies. See, this is something that you know if you know Allah, you can come to this conclusion. We will now talk briefly about something which many people attributed to Allah and uh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it cannot be the case. And that is uh, the claim that Allah has children. The Arabs to whom the Prophet ﷺ was sent used to say that all the angels are the daughters of Allah. Um, uh, one small Jewish sect at the time of the Prophet used to say, Uzair is Ibn Allah. And the Christians, as you know, say, Jesus is the only son of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does the Quran say? The Quran says, if you believe that Allah is a creator, then you can come to the conclusion that he cannot be father. You cannot be father and creator at the same time. It is impossible. Logically impossible. If he is a creator, then his relationship with everything else 
is that of the creator to the created. Now, if you say he has a father, has a child, then what is the relationship between this father and his child? If the father is the creator, then who created the son for him? A father does not create his son. Hmm? You do something else to have a, a, a son. You don't, create, you don't create him. If you create him, then he is not your son in any real sense. The Quran also said, if Allah is the creator, then everything belongs to him. They said that Allah has taken unto himself a child. قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا سُبْحَانَ Exalted be he. قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا سُبْحَانَ هُوَ الْغَنِي He is self-sufficient. He is self-sufficient, therefore he doesn't need to have, he is not in need of a child. لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Everything that is in the, uh, on the earth or in the heavens belongs to him. He owns it. And you don't own your child. لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ إِنَّ عِنْدَكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ بِهَذَا Do you have any evidence for this? Do you have any sultan, hujja, argument, evidence for this? أَتَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ How can you say about Allah something of which you have no uh, uh, knowledge? The Quran also says, for someone to be a father, he must have a wife. How can he have a child seeing that he has no wife? A father does not give birth to the child. It is the mother who does this. So who is the mother of Jesus? If you say it is Mary, and you say Allah is his father, then what is the conclusion? But they don't say this. No one says that Mary is the wife of the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then if you say Allah has no wife, then where did the son come from? Who gave birth to the son? Now, in this way, I mean, the Quran... Uh, I want to say also, uh, by the way, that um, the, the question uh, I think was raised yesterday about how do we um, argue with people who are non-Muslims. Many people think that to argue with non-Muslims, you should not use the Quran. Uh, this is based on the false assumption that the Quran addresses only those who believe that is, it is the word of Allah. But this is not true. The Quran sometimes, most of the time, addresses people who believe that it is the word of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on many other occasions, it, it addresses people who don't believe that it is the word of Allah. How does it address them? By giving them evidence. This is one of the great advantages of the religion of Islam, is that you have bridges between you and other people. And that those bridges are rationality, because every normal human being should be rational. Morality, every normal human being, even if he tells lies or so, he will acknowledge the fact that it is bad to tell a uh, lie, and so on. So there are bridges between Muslims and non-Muslims. We use those bridges to go from Islam to those people because those bridges are themselves part of our deen. So if someone, <clears throat> um, if one says, someone says that he doesn't believe in this because he doesn't believe that the Quran, because he doesn't believe that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
then we give we must him give him evidence that the Quran is the word of Allah we must give him evidence that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah we must give him evidence about every um, every one of the fundamentals of the religion in many other religions they ask you just to commit yourself the Quran doesn't say this no when it comes to the fundamentals it gives evidence independent evidence when it comes to what is based on those fundamentals then you don't need direct evidence if someone says I don't believe that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah then I give him evidence to show that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah then if he believes that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah and then I tell him that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said pray maghrib three rak'at then he asked me why maghrib three and fajr two can I give him independent evidence for this no because this is based on something whose truth I have proved before you see this is like what you do in geometry hmm? you prove a theorem then you prove your proof of the other another theorem which is based on that you cannot prove the the second one independently of the first so if someone says why maghrib talata three i say because allah said so and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wise he's always tell he always tells the truth and there are many things in which there is wisdom of which you are not aware so this is the kind of evidence that i can give him why why shouldn't we eat pork a muslim when he doesn't eat pork he is not eating pork not because he knew some of the bad things about pork or so but because he has trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he knows that this is what allah said and uh, uh, and he obeys allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there is a difference between giving evidence for the fundamentals of the religion that the quran is the word of allah yes i must give him independent of it i can't say it is the word of allah because muhammad says it is the word of allah and if he asked me what is the proof that muhammad uh, is the prophet of allah i say that the quran says that muhammad is a this is a vicious circle i have to give him evidence on uh, on uh, my evidence has to be based on something which he accepts on something which, and this is what the quran says about uh, prophethood of muhammad about the quran about resurrection when people came to the prophet and said uh, how can how, how can uh, bodies be resurrected after they died uh, if the person died and um, his body you know, changed into um, became part of the earth and so on the, the answer was very clear do you believe that he created you the first time they says oh if he created you the first time it shouldn't be different for him to create you again if you say you don't believe that he created you the first time it says and your problem is bigger that was start with that if you if you accept that then we come to this and so on about the, there are many arguments in the Quran about uh, the, the 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 hereafter uh, so i wanted to give you just um, uh, examples uh, to occupy the time before the sheikh comes and he has come the so uh, the driver is here so jazakumullah <laughs> khair bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ما بعد you like this no not cool okay first of all i want to 
Huh? You like that? <laughs> what, 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 you're going to do that. I got one for you. Here. Okay. This is the driver's cap. All right. First of all, I want to extend the salams, the greetings of peace to all of my brothers and sisters here in Bangalore, India, from, from our country. Uh, we have many Muslims, I don't know if you know this, in the United States of America. In fact, many of them came from right here in India. And all of them want to be sure that I give big salams to everybody. So, inshallah, I'll do that right now. Salaam alaikum rahmatullah. The second thing is that I turned out to be a real Muslim after all. And how is that? Because I noticed the difference in timing. In my country, uh, the, and Britain is the same way. Everybody's real punctual, punctual. They got a big thing about being on time. And you know what? I must be a Muslim because I was late tonight. <laughs> we have, in our country, we call it... You were on time? Yeah, but you were... <laughs> are you sure? Hmm. We have in our country what we call Eastern Standard Time, EST. Then we have CST, Central Standard Time. MST, Mountain Standard Time. Then we have... PST, Pacific Standard Time, and then we got one for the whole country for the Muslims there. It's called AST, Arabic Standard Time, which is about an hour behind everybody else. In any case, the subject tonight really is a very serious one. So I think it's important for us to pay very close attention to this subject. The subject is about Islam versus terrorism usually I see them right on the banners it will say Islam and terrorism but I want you to be sure you understand versus terrorism when there's going to be a fight or some kind of a bout a boxer is going to come to town and they're going to fight it out they put the name of one and then VS and then the name of the other one this will be, for instance, uh, Folsom versus Shylock. And that means these two are fighting against each other. So this is why I want to say Islam versus terrorism, because certainly one fights the other. In our country, there is a very big misconception about Islam versus terrorism. I'm sure that there's a certain amount of that all over the world because of the tremendous hype that is being received everywhere through the media. And so the first thing to do is talk about the media. Media is a way of communicating ideas and information. And it's a very important thing for all of us. This is something that's been going on since human beings knew how to speak. It's for people to go into places and share information from other places. This is not new at all. As a matter of fact, that's how Islam spread, exactly through media, versus the sword, meaning Islam didn't spread by a sword. It spread by media. Media or stories is called hadith. All right? In Islam, we have a science of media or hadith and it helps us to determine whether or not the information being presented to us is accurate. For instance, if someone says to me that Abdullah said to Abdurrahman and he said to... Aisha, and she said to Sheikh Jafar, and Sheikh Jafar said to me, the only person you're looking at is me. How do you know I'm telling the truth? Well, wait a minute, hold on. Sheikh Jafar's sitting right there, and you saw him just say something to me a minute ago, so maybe it could be possible. The other people are not here, 
The only way we'd be able to check that out now is to ask him, what is the veracity of Aisha, the one who told it to him? Do you know Aisha? And if he said, well, not really, then how valuable would that information be? Likewise, if we ask Aisha, if she's here, we said to her, what about Abdurrahman and Abdullah? And if she says, I don't know who they are, or I just met him yesterday, then what is the value of this hadith or media? Pretty much nothing. Okay? But for sure, you want to check out the one who's talking to you. And if you find that this man is given to prevarication, meaning he lies, then what's the value of anything he says? Right? So this is how we should be today as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Hujurat, chapter 49 of the Qur'an, Allah is very clear on this subject. He warns us, it's in uh, 49 verse 6, O you who believe, Ya Yuladina Amanu, if a fasik, and this is a disobedient person or liar, comes to you with information or news, then you have to ascertain the veracity or attest to it to find out if it's real. Unless you find yourself harming people in ignorance and afterwards you will regret what you have done. Now I want you to think the next time somebody tells you something, who are they? Who is the one speaking to you? If it's in a newspaper, who is the journalist? If it's on television, who are these people? And then who are their sponsors? Who are the ones having them say these words? Are they saying all of the truth or just what fits in a five-minute segment? Are they prejudiced? In my country, we have some people that are prejudiced, meaning... They like themselves so much, the group they don't like, they will lie on them. Even if it's not true, they say it anyway because, oh well, they're African American, so we'll say this about them. So, I don't know, do you have prejudice here in India? Does people ever do that? Ah, oh, okay. So the first thing to do is realize if you know for sure they've lied about something else, throw everything they say. If what they say is questionable, or maybe not all of the truth, then at least think about what you're hearing. But for sure, if you know something to be the opposite, if they tell you it's light outside right now, what do you consider that? Are you going to consider the obvious or are you going to try to say, well, maybe they meant, you know, it's almost light or maybe they meant there's lights over there somewhere or, you know, let's be realistic. Tell it like it is. Okay? That's the first part. The next part deals with what some people do. Some people do bad things in the United States of America. But does that make everybody in the United States of America a bad person? Some people do bad things right here in Bangalore, India. But does that mean everybody here is bad? And often, just as when I was in Pakistan, the residents will speak harshly about themselves without realizing it. And say things like, Everybody here in my country is corrupt. There's nothing but corruption. There's no honest people. And you say, really? Are you sure? Yes, there's no honest people. That's right. They're all liars, right? Well, for sure, the only one I know about is you, and you just said you were a liar. Therefore, everybody must be honest except you. But we don't think of it that way. We don't realize we're including ourselves, our mothers. Are you going to let somebody call your mother a liar? You just did. When you said everybody in my country is a liar. 
And it's not true, is it? But there are some bad people in every single city on this earth, but it doesn't make all the earth bad. Likewise, there are some people who call themselves Muslim and they do some bad things, but that has nothing to do with Islam. So now let's find out right now and right here exactly what is Islam versus terrorism. I'll begin with the word Islam itself. Zakallah khair. Hold it. Yeah. It's a commercial break. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of commercial breaks, we have an internet website at islamtomorrow.com. I S L A M T O M O W R O W dot com. We broadcast through the internet 24 hours a day. You can go there and listen to our programming 24 hours a day. IslamTomorrow.com We have another internet website called Islam Always. And another one, Islam Yesterday. And I'm thinking about getting one called Islam Forever and Ever, Amin. But anyway... Our websites are open 24 hours a day and there's plenty of free parking. I thought that would go over big here in this place. There's no parking anywhere. Alhamdulillah. Now I want to come back to our subject. We're talking about Islam versus terrorism. The first word Islam needs to be understood in the language that it comes from. Fila go Arabia. In the Arabic language, Islam comes from this root, Salama. And from this, many words come. And Islam is one that contains other words in it. Often I hear Muslims say, Islam is peace. However, Islam is more than peace. It contains four other beautiful words that equal the real peace. First of all, there is surrender like when somebody comes in with guns and they tell you give up you give up i surrender that's the first word second word submit this is when you're going to sign an agreement and you're going to do what it says it's called the shahada the third word is obey that means you're going to do what you said you would do when you signed the paper and then the next word is sincerity it means that you're going to do what you said you were going to do and you're going to do it because you know you should whether anybody knows it or not and whether anybody likes it or not. You're sincerely going to do what you said. And then finally, you do it in peace. And then you receive peace from As-Salam. And that's the name of Allah, the peace. So it means a peace between you and your creator and sustainer. And it means a peace inside of you and a peace around you no matter what's happening because you know this is from your Lord. It does not mean peace in the Middle East, although that is a big goal and desire of all of us as Muslims. It does not mean peace on earth, goodwill to men, something that's said very frequently at Christmas time, like now. But we would like to see that as well. But for sure, Islam is about the relationship of a human being and their Lord. The second word I want to talk about, the verses, in this corner, weighing 240 pounds, the other word called terrorism. Okay? What is terrorism? What is it? Of course, it comes with the word terror. What is terror? Check it out in your dictionary. It's not a good word, is it? Terror. It's to put fear into something. A, a, a terror is even more than fear. Fear, you're afraid of something. Terror is when it is beyond normal fear. Beyond normal fear. A terror of something. Okay? Now, did either of those words sound like they match? Islam, terrorism. Does it fit? Linguistically, you have to say, no, these don't fit. Next, let's look at the teachings of Islam, as Dr. Jafar Sheikh Yajiris was just telling us about 
accepting something once it's established. You've established something, you move to the next and the next and the next. Once you establish in your mind, with no doubt, there is a God. There's no doubt in your mind there's a God. And most of the people on this earth today do believe that there is a God. They have a different perception, but the majority of all the earth-bound, air-breathing mammals called human beings accept that there really is a God that created them and takes care of them. Okay? But once you accept that there's a God, then you accept that this Quran could only have come from that God. And in this Quran, it clearly states that you are not a believer until you have made Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a judge in the matters where you in dispute. Once you've understood that, and by the way, if you want to reference that's chapter 4, verse 65, an Nisa, verse 65. Once you've established in your mind that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in fact the one who brought this Quran from his Lord, you don't have any option in the matter. You take it and you buy it wholesale, complete, and semina wa atana. We hear and we obey. Now, that is the concept being used to say Muslims will do anything. Well, we will. That's true. If that's the accusation, guilty. If you're saying we'll do anything that our Lord has ordered us to do, we'll sure try. So if that's your accusation, then yes, guilty. Guilty of absolutely following what our Lord has ordered us to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be a believer. But the next thing some very evil people have done, regardless if they call themselves Muslim or Christian or atheist, it's a very evil thing when you lie against the law and his messenger. Because clearly Allah says in the Quran, hated to Allah is that you lie, you say what you don't do, that you prevaricate, that you misrepresent something. It's not acceptable. Many of the articles being written against Islam quote one part of a verse and then mistranslate it. Corrupt it, twist it, take it totally out of context, or use translators' mistakes. But I'm going to share with you that having been a Christian for nearly 50 years, a very dedicated Christian, very much loving the Lord, I very much still to this minute love Jesus the Christ, because that tells us right in here, this is a confirmation of Jesus is right here. I have no doubt in my mind, after studying this in the Arabic text, that there is anything in Islam that would underwrite acts of terrorism. All I can find in the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, are acts versus terrorism. There isn't enough time in one little lecture to cover this subject in detail. That's why I mentioned our website, so you can pick it all up over there. But quickly, I'm going to give you a couple of pointers and let you consider for yourself. The first one is when someone says, well, you know those Muslims have been ordered to kill all the Christians and Jews wherever they find them. Wherever you find them, kill them, it says in the newspaper. And I live in Washington, D.C. area. We get the Washington Post. I pick it up, I look in there, I say, whoa, where's that in the Quran? I call him up, I say, who is the journalist that wrote this thing? Where did you get that? I'm, I'm not familiar with the verse. Oh, you know, the whole Quran's loaded with stuff like that. I said, really? Just give me one reference. They said, well, verse 191 in Surah Baqarah, the chapter called The Cow. Well, it does start out exactly like they said. And kill them wherever you find them. Whoa. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
and kill them wherever you find them. I'm looking at the translation called the Noble Quran by Dr. Musan Khan and Dr. Muhammad Hilali. Published by Dar es Salaam. That's the one I use all the time. It says it. By God, they're right. And kill them wherever you find them. Whoa. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Uh, did you hear Christians and Jews in there? I must have missed that. Let's go back and look again. And kill them wherever you find them. That could be talking about bugs. Come to think about it, it just says and. Wait a minute. When was the last time you started a sentence with the word and? Let me check this out in Arabic. How many of you know Arabic? Anybody know Arabic? Anybody? Okay, well, there's, there's a thing in Arabic that looks like a comma. It's kind of round and has a tail on it called a wow. Okay, that's the word and in Arabic. It's a conjunction to say this and this. Doesn't necessarily mean plus, like one plus one, but it's an and. Let's see if it says that. Wa. Yep, there it is. There's an and right there. Wa katilu. That's what it says. Wa katilu. Hmm. Is that right, Sheikh? Wa. Wa katilu. Right there. Yeah. Wa katilu. I just give you the first two words. That's the ones they're quoting in the newspaper. That's my point. But when was the last time you started a sentence with and? It means there's something right before that, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Well, I don't like it when people do that, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. I don't like it when the men in Islam start out saying wakul, in Surah An Nisa, chapter 24, verse 31, they begin to tell the women about lowering their gaze and wearing hijab. It says, Wakul. Because they don't want to mention the verse before it that said, Kul. Say to the believing men to lower their gaze, to guard their private parts. Uh, they don't want to mention the men have a responsibility in this deal too. And the same way when somebody misquotes this verse, starting out with Wa. I want to go back to the verse before and find out what you're hiding from me. Let's see where it says Christians and Jews in here. Uh-huh. Well, wait a minute. It doesn't say that, does it? Hmm. Nope. doesn't say that. No, it doesn't. What it says is they're asking you, Muhammad, about the new moons. Maybe I'm supposed to kill the moon. A balance, yes or no? Okay, cool. Moving forward. <laughs> this idea, this idea of rights and limitations is introduced very beautifully with this verse, these three verses actually in the Quran. It's also understood when you know the story that the Muslims had been, before Islam, very ignorant, fighting all the time. I'll tell you one story only because there's not enough time. One story, there was a camel race. At the end of the race, the tribe that lost to the other tribes, one of the boys picks up a rock and throws it at the camel. When he did, it killed the camel. So the boy that has this camel became upset, wants to kill their camel or kill the boy. So a war starts between the two tribes and they're going after each other. Boom, 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 bang, bang, bang. How many years did they fight the war of the camel? Forty years. Killing each other in a tribal feud over a race. You didn't have to tell Arabs how to fight. But when they entered Islam, they were forbidden to go out and aggressively pursue those who were persecuting them. They were only allowed self-defense. So I want to share with you, jihad does not mean self-defense. It's more than that. Self-defense is always there. You, you, somebody come up and slap you, you can hold yourself off. But to retaliate back, this was held back until these verses came. For 13 years, the Muslims were very restricted in what they could do physically. They had to tolerate, endure, and learn a word called sabr, patience. The Prophet ﷺ was the epitome of patience in a human being. He was very patient. And one time, there was a lot of aggression and oppression 
physical abuse against the Muslims right in front of the Kaaba in Mecca. And one of the companions went to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and complained and asked him, please pray to your Lord, make dua that Allah will take this off of us, etc., etc. And he didn't do it. In fact, he turned to him and he said, oh, so and so, don't you know that all of the prophets before us, they had these experiences. And be, uh, actually, uh, the people before us had worse experiences. Was, and he was talking about the Christians, how the Christians had to endure the same kinds of things in the first years after Jesus had left the earth. Peace be upon him. He mentioned, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned that they were tortured in horrible ways. They had their skin combed off of them with an iron comb. They were boiled like you boil a potato. They were cut in half. They put a saw in their skull and cut them in half. Having studied the, personally the early years of Christianity, we have record of them being thrown into the lion's pit, being thrown into the amphitheater so that the Romans could enjoy a nice afternoon out and go to the amphitheater at night. Let's go out and watch the Christians being eaten alive by the lions and bears and beaten to death by the Roman gladiators. That's what they suffered. And they had to endure it with patience. So this has to be understood in the way that it came. After they had moved to Yathrib or Maghreb, which is years of patience that they waited. Then the verse comes and orders them to do what? Combat. Yukatilu. Combat. Not slaughter, but kill in the sense of mortal combat. Go to war, willing to die or be killed or kill because they're doing that to you. Combat those that combat you. That's the kind of kill that's being imp uh, implied in the verse here with the word kital. And by the way, the word jihad is not in these ayahs. It is not. Jihad is a very wide word and carries a heavy meaning. But here, particularly, kital is talking about mortal combat. The very same thing that Mr. George W. Bush ordered when he sent people out to Afghanistan and into Iraq is mortal combat. But Islam is having limits, big limits. Fight only those who are fighting you. Kill only those who are trying to kill you, but as soon as they stop, you have to stop. It is forbidden in Islam to kill the innocents. If you're going to quote to me from this book and consider that I believe it and I'm going to follow it, then please, please take the time to go to chapter 5, which is Sur al Mayada, and look to the verse that clearly states that if anybody takes an innocent life, it's as though they killed all of humanity. It's uh, verse 32, by the way. And if they save a life, then it's as though they saved the entire mankind. And indeed, there came to them our messengers with clear proofs, evidences, and signs. Even then, after that, many of them continued to exceed limits in the land. And understand Islam is about these limits. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want Muslims to be like the ignorant Arabs and just trashing people to the ground. In the Bible itself, in the book called Genesis, toward the end of the book called Genesis, there is a chapter or a whole section called The Rape of Dinah. It deals with the subject of a boy from a non-Jewish tribe who took a girl from the Jewish tribes. He loved her. He wanted to marry her. The tribal leaders from the Jews went to them according to the Bible, read it for yourself, and said, 
We want this girl back. The chief of the tribe said, it's my son that took her. We didn't mean you any harm, but, you know, let's make up like this. We will give you gifts. We will give you money. We will give you sheep. Let us keep this girl. He loves her. She loves him. Can they be together? They said, no, we're coming back. So they came back with their tribes. The Jewish tribes were ready to fight. But then they realized, oh, my God, look at how many there are of the other people. They were huge in number. So when they realized they were outnumbered, they made another conference between them. They sat together and they said, listen, we've got to work this out. We want the girl back. The tribal leader said, listen, we're willing to do this. Whatever it would take to satisfy you. They said, we can't let her be married to him because he's not Jewish, not from us. He said, okay, we're ready to accept your religion we're ready to accept your religion, whatever it takes. And then, if you'll accept us, we will give you our lands and our animals, and you'll be with us just as our own brothers. You'll take our wives, we'll take wives from you, your children and our children together. We'll accept that term of peace. Could we do that? It says in the Bible, the Jews agreed to that based on one thing. You'll have to be circumcised. Fatan, same as we do today as Muslims. The men have to remove the foreflesh of the private part. And that's what it says real clear in the Bible. You do that, and then it'll be hunky-dory. We'll go for it. That's Texas translation, by the way. Next thing, it says that they cut themselves, starting with the boy, the son of the tribal leader, cut himself like this. That, I don't know if you got any idea what I'm talking about. That's horrible, okay? That's amazing. And every member of the tribe, they made sure every member of their whole entire tribe did this to themselves. And it says in the Bible, three days later, when the men couldn't even move, it said they were sore. You bet they were. They couldn't move. It said that's when the Jews came in and killed them all, slaughtered them all, men, boys, and kept the women for themselves, took all of their land, all of their property, and all of their sheep. And they were very proud of themselves. They went back to their father Jacob and told him the story. And it said he was disappointed. This book, the Quran, forbids all of that. First of all, you can't lie about the religion. You have to tell people what it is. But they're always welcome to enter Islam. But the next thing is, especially, especially when you make a truce or an agreement, you have to follow through on it in Islam. You cannot deceive people with that. And when somebody declares, the shadow of la ilaha illallah, shadow of Muhammad or Rasulullah, I bear witness there's none to worship except God alone, and Muhammad's his messenger, he's your brother. And the Prophet ﷺ said, his life and his property are safe from your hand. The opposite of the teaching of the Bible in that area. By the way, I don't believe everything I read in the Bible, but I definitely believe that it's right here when it tells me to have limits, not to go in and kill all the boys and men, not to go in and steal all the women and rape them. Killing babies even, stealing their land after you made a promise with them. And this is what Allah is forbidding right here for the Muslim, for the Arabs, and all Muslims ever since. That's what it says. That's how I understood it. If somebody has some other Quran that they know about, bring it and let's have a look at it. As far as I know, there's only one Quran on the entire earth, and it's exactly like everyone else on the entire earth. So, excuse me, but where do you get out of that? Islam is terrorism. I see it real clear. Islam is against terrorism. In fact... If there is aggression, if there is oppression, if there is dhulam and fitna, if there is terrorism on this earth, it's Islam that declared the war against terrorism 1,400 years ago, and it's called Jihad Sabili Law. This is not a subject that we're going to cover all the details in one short speech. But it is definitely a message that has to get out to every Muslim first. 
and then every other person on this planet. You may ask yourself, why did you say Muslims? Because my brothers and sisters in Islam, it's too often that I hear Muslims apologizing for Islam. Allah will never accept that. And the Muslim brothers and sisters who have died on the haqqa la ilaha illallah, on the truth of Islam for 1400 years, would not be very proud of you today to hear you apologize for something that has nothing wrong in it. Until we stand up for what real truth is and show people the beauty, the sweetness of the deen of Islam, the power that Allah gives to the true believers, until we do this, we're not living up to it. The people can't see it. But before I end this little talk, I want to be sure that I balance the scale. I want to talk about the position of a non-Muslim. A person who is not Muslim, looking at what's being presented in the media today, has a right to be afraid. Because a non-Muslim doesn't really have the taqwa for Allah. And when you don't have taqwa for Allah, you're going to have taqwa for everything else that Allah created. Meaning, if you don't fear Allah, you'll fear what He created. So they're very much afraid. And they're responding to that fear. And until they can understand real Islam, they'll continue to do what they're doing. They see us, one and a half billion people in the world, as a threat, as an enemy to them. Because we have not lived up to the message. We have not presented Islam to them correctly. And therefore, they fear what they don't know, what they don't understand. And that's logical. People always fear what they don't understand. Who is going to carry this message to these people? Huh? Are we going to go to Madison Avenue? Are we going to go to Hollywood, California and ask these great promoters of media to put together a package for us and put it on their news? I don't think so. In fact, I know so. The way that we're going to present this message is the way that it was presented 1400 years ago. By living the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa By sacrificing our lives and our work and our money. Not to kill people. But to kill inside of ourselves this nafs. So that we can stand up and be real Muslims. So when they see the sweetness of the deen in us. They're going to say I want to be like you. I want to be like you. And when you look at yourself in the mirror, ask yourself, is this a person that other people would like to become like? Because if the answer is no, then you're not representing Islam, are you? But if you can look in the mirror and say, this is somebody representing Islam, then get out there and let them see it in us. I'm not blaming them for doing what they are naturally going to do. But I'm blaming you and myself and every Muslim on this earth who has not presented this message correctly. Let us make a firm resolve from this point forward that when you leave out of this building tonight, that it's not the same person who walked in here. That your life is changed that we are a better person, that we're going to abide by the rules, regulations, and commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the sunnah of His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us make that resolve. Let us ask Allah to guide us first and in so doing, help others to see the beautiful guidance of Islam. Amen. I ask for the guidance of Allah I ask for the guidance for all of the people that Allah give Hidayah, Muslims and non-Muslims. Amen. And I ask that He give us the good of this life and the good of the next life and save us from the punishment of His fire. Amen. Rabbana Amen.
Rabbana la tu zig kulu bana bada it ha de tana wahab lana mela duka rakma and akan to wahab amin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salaita ali Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim and akhamin al majid amin. Jazakum Allah khair. I ask Allah to forgive me for any mistakes. Anything good said here tonight was from Allah. The mistakes are from myself. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa atubu alayk. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulullah. Before I walk off the stage, there is something that I wanted to say. If you let me have this couple minutes. It's not really rehearsed or planned or anything. Just I want to say thank you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for letting me come here. I've never been to India before. And I want to thank Allah for letting me meet all my beautiful brothers and sisters in Islam. And I really, I, I can't tell you, it's more than just joy. It's been a real deep pleasure in my heart to have this chance and experience to be with all of you. And I especially thank my brothers and sisters here at this, well, you, you call it the vision of Islam, peace, right? Peace conference. I love this. I just love this idea, the concept so much. Thank you for inviting me to come. And I pray to Allah, please Allah, let this type of activity continue. Let this type of message get out to all the people. I've already seen some people entering into Islam here from this. And this is a great joy for all of us. I'm very, very happy to see this. But more than that, I'm seeing how many people get the understanding of the real Islam. It's their choice if they want it or not, but at least they know what real Islam is. And through this effort, there's 360 panels displayed over there. I don't know if you've been through those or not. We have nothing like this in the United States. I was so blown away, as the kids say. It's great. I love it. Uh, it was so wonderful. And it's wonderful to be with all of you. I hope and I pray that Allah will make a way for me to be able to come back to you again in May when they have the next program. So please... Uh, I'd like to give you again the salams from, from the brothers there. And if you would like me to send the salams to them, just return it. Salam alaikum. <laughs>